It is wonderful to see so many of you out today to hear about our DEI progress. And uh, first I'd like to introduce our signer here, Katie Kaur. Um, she'll be providing the ASL interpretation for today's event. Um, most of you know me, but I am Katrina Way Golden, and I serve as the Deputy Chief Diversity Officer here at the university. And again, it is wonderful to see so many of you out today, students, faculty, and staff, to share in much of the progress that we've been able to make and to really jumpstart the work that is before us as we continue to move forward to make our institution one that is more diverse, more equitable, and inclusive. So it is now my pleasure to bring to the stage our uh, Chief Diversity Officer, Robert M. Sellers. And it has been such a pleasure to work and partner with Rob. Um, he is the best boss to work for, and he fights for us in spaces that we would never know in terms of um, resources, human, technical, and financial, to really move this work forward. So it is my pleasure to bring to the stage Robert M. Sellers. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, my pleasure today to um, have an opportunity to share with you some of the progress that you've already made with regard to our DEI uh, strategic planning process. But before we do that, I think it's extremely important that we also acknowledge the land for which uh, that we are currently on. The University of Michigan resides on the traditional territories of the three fires people, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands we now live and learn. I want to also let you know that uh, we have restrooms, uh, accessible and gender inclusive restrooms. We have restrooms that are not as inclusive that are located down at the end of the uh, hallway, and then we have uh, gender-inclusive uh, restrooms that are located on the third floor in room 3343, and a lactation reflection room that is located on the third floor in room 347. So today's uh, uh, session is really about reviewing the progress that has been made so far in the university's DEI strategic plan. We've just completed year three, we've started year four, and today what I'll do is give you a brief, very, very brief review of the DEI plan. How many people were here at the uh, beginning of the planning process? Okay. So that's part of the uh, characteristics of this university is it's dynamic and it's constantly changing. After giving a very brief overview of the uh, planning process, uh, I will also uh, give you some snippets of some feedback that we've received uh, during last winter and through the spring with regards to the DEI strategic planning process. Some of that feedback was provided by some of you who are in the room. So we went around and talked to faculty, staff, students uh, through town hall meetings and other forums to get information about the planning process itself as well as brought in uh, experts from outside of the university to take a look at uh, how we're implementing the plan. Then we will pivot and talk a little bit about how far we have progressed, how far we've come. I'll uh, just show you small snippets of information with regards to our progress. Then we will uh, stop for a uh, question and answer session. I'll be happy to answer or at least try to answer uh, questions. And then we'll break up into our tables and we'll have a tabletop discussion exercise where we'll uh, ask you questions about your experiences with respect to the DEI uh, plan implementation process uh, at your tables and then we'll share some of that out. And then finally, we'll have a wrap up session, okay? Let me start off and be very, very clear with regards to what the objective is with respect to our DEI strategic plan. 
It is a simple one, but it's one that often gets forgotten. And that is that our plan is long-term, sustainable, institutional, cultural change. And the change being making the university a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. I think it's important that we start there to understand that we're talking about cultural change. By definition, that requires hard work. It means that the work has to be pervasive throughout the organization. It will take time. As Charles Moody often told me, remember, it took the university 200 years to get like this, and it's not going to change overnight. It also means that the change must happen at multiple levels of the university. This university is a decentralized um, um, conglomerate of a number, of a countless number of micro climates and environments. And if we're going to make long-term sustainable change, that change has to happen at the level of the microclimates as well as other levels up throughout the university. Which means that some of the progress will be uneven. We'll make progress faster in some spaces than others, but yet with a sustained long-term strategic plan, we believe we can make the kind of change that we want to see. Just to give you, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning of the process or not really sure what we're doing, let me give you a brief uh, uh, synopsis of what the strategic plan is all about. It's really not one plan, it's actually 51 different plans. So we have a larger university level plan that addresses issues that can only be addressed at the level of the university. Uh, also part of that plan is to provide resources to support the unit level plans and to look at really good ideas, best practices that we can then scale up to a larger scale. In addition, there are 50 different unit level plans. So every major administrative unit uh, throughout the campus has a DEI strategic plan. And really that 50 number is a misnomer because within the um, uh, health system, we count it as one in our 50, but there are more than 200 different um, uh, DEI activities that are occurring uh, within the units. The plan itself addresses three areas, climate, creating a more equitable and diverse community, as well as issues of science and teaching, or sorry, scholarship and teaching. We recognize that the University of Michigan has been involved in DEI efforts that predate the planning process. And in fact, we celebrate some of the progress that's already been made. And so we have organizations and units that are already in place that have been doing this work. The plan attempts to include those units and provide more resources. But at the same point in time, we have to create new infrastructures focused specifically on the planning process. One example being uh, many of the uh, outstanding individuals who are part of our DEI leads uh, and the uh, wonderful staff that work in my office that help uh, coordinate those efforts. Our, our uh, DEI plan is one that is focused on metrics and using reporting out as a form of accountability as well as a form of um, I just lost my train of thought, a form of visibility. With that overall arching uh, effort to change the uh, overall objective of the university to be more diverse, equity, and inclusive, we do so with three primary goals. To recruit, retain, and develop a more diverse community of students, staff, and faculty. So we're really focusing on people to promote a more equitable and inclusive climate. I'd like to think about that in terms of process, uh, mainly because it's another P. And then um, to infuse diversity, equity, and inclusion into our teaching, scholarship, and service activities. So if you think about what we do, what is it that we produce as a university, our product is our teaching, our scholarship, and our service. And we want DEI to be infused in all of those. 
In doing so, in trying to make this long-term, sustainable, organizational cultural change, we are using a number of different uh, approaches and a number of different tasks that have been identified in the organizational uh, change literature as being necessary and effective. So our overall change model includes raising institutional awareness, making DEI be something that everyone in the institution knows about, understands, and is front and center in mind. We want to enhance individual skills and capacities, align policies, procedures, and programs related to DEI. We want to make sure that we have cultural norms and other reinforcers to reinforce the DEI values. And we want to make sure that we broaden access, look for uh, areas and things that restrict access both in the university and up through different levels of leadership. In doing, in utilizing each of these skill sets or each of these tools, uh, it is our belief that we can make this university more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. Now, let me uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about where we are with regards to the plan implementation process. So we are smack dab, just finished the halfway point in this process. And in the interest of continuous improvement, we, like I said, spent a lot of time going out talking to you to get a sense of your perceptions of what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong, what are things that we could do better in terms of the DEI plan implementation process itself. From this feedback from students, faculty, and staff, we literally got hundreds of different ideas and our staff read each and every one of those ideas. And how many people actually participated in one of those uh, um, town hall meetings, either with faculty, students, and staff? So all of those little cards that you filled out, we looked at all of those. We then came up with basically the top five uh, 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 issues that were um, uh, described as being things that we'd like to see more of here at the university. So they include more DEI training for all, greater integration of DEI in our curriculum, increased recruitment and retention of underrepresented students, faculty, and staff, assess and address possible identity-based pay equity issues for faculty and staff, and more support for underrepresented members who disproportionately do the DEI work. So these are the five things that we heard in terms of the most um, salient comments that were made. One of the things that was uh, surprising to me, or, or at least jumped out to me in those different sessions, is that sitting and talking with different folks at the tables, um, many of the ideas that were put forward were actually things that we are currently doing. Now clearly that suggests that we either need to do it better or we need to do a better job of advertising uh, and making known what's actually happening. So for instance, you'll see later on that we've had uh, more than 20,000 individuals who've been involved with some forms of DEI training through our Department of Organizational Learning. And we've had DEI training that's uh, occurring at all levels of the university, from students, faculty, staff, up through uh, deans, uh, the EOs, and even the regents. Uh, also, we have a number of initiatives focused on DEI curriculum, but clearly we can do uh, more in that integration. The assessing and addressing possible identity-based pay equity issues for faculty and staff was perhaps the one issue that I've heard throughout this entire process most often, uh, particularly from staff, but also from faculty. And that's an issue that we are currently working on in terms of figuring out how best to address it. And then last but not least, the support for underrepresented members who disproportionately do the DEI work. We've tried and will continue to try through a number of different ways to provide both recognition, uh, support, and um, uh, other ways to try to get our leaders uh, and others to understand that this DEI work 
is not just on the, should not just come on the backs of those individuals who are traditionally underrepresented. So we have things like the university diversity, um, um, uh, university distinguished, uh, I'm sorry, university diversity and social transformation uh, professorship as a way of acknowledging work uh, from faculty in terms of what they've done in the context of DEI. Also the Distinguished Diversity Leadership uh, Awards uh, focusing on staff in terms of outstanding work. In addition, we also uh, received feedback from external reviewers, uh, three external reviewers who came and spent time on our campus looking at the DEI process. They uh, were charged to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of our plan implementation process, not necessarily the outcomes. Those outcomes will be evaluated at the end of the five-year plan. The team examined documents, DEI materials, interviewed over 100 plus individuals at different spaces and places within the uh, university and within the DEI uh, plan implementation process. They uh, put forth a few recommendations with regards to the strengths of the program. They include a clear articulation of commitment to DEI from senior leadership. They felt another strength of the program was the plan's comprehensiveness, the fact that we were attempting to address all of these different issues, uh, including issues of access, opportunity, climate, uh, issues that focus not only at the curricular level, but also uh, address staff experiences, students' experiences across all of the uh, administrative units of the university. They also noted the passion and engagement of our staff in particular. And that's a group that they were particularly impressed with in terms of uh, the work that is being done there. And there was a, also a sense that there was a widespread interest and commitment to create a deeper culture of change and respect. So these are the, the strengths of what they found. In addition, they suggested that these are some areas of improvement from what they heard both from you and their uh, examination. That DEI expectations in the annual review process should, while that's a step forward, there's also a need for greater consequences for uh, that, uh, those individuals who are not achieving expectation. They also argued for more improved messaging with respect to students and including DEI into new student orientation, which it actually is a part of the new student orientation process, but that was one of their recommendations. And then to provide more direction from central administration on what is next. So when they came in, one of the questions that was phrased was, so what happens after year five? Is this just a five-year uh, planning process or will there be more? And the reality is that the president has committed for as long as he's here, DEI will be a part of his uh, presidential mantle. What will happen at the end of the five-year plan, whether we will have a new DEI uh, strategic planning process that looks the same or similar is still up in the air. We're in the process of evaluating what's worked, what hasn't worked. What I can guarantee you is that DEI 2.0 will exist, that there will be continued work and significant work in which the institution is committed to making the university more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. This was their summary statement. This is what they concluded at the end of this process. In summary, it's clear that the University of Michigan has done its homework and pulled from the best practices for engaging diversity, equity, and inclusion across the country and refined them in such a way as to make them uniquely their own. The fact that DEI leaders were able to do this in such a short amount of time and maintain such a high degree of, in, of engagement with virtually every stakeholder group is nothing short of extraordinary. 
Indeed, peer institutions would benefit greatly from examining Michigan's approach to implementation and execution, as it has undoubtedly put the university on a path to success in creating a welcoming and inclusive environment for all. So this was the external reviewer's ultimate conclusion with regards to where we are. So you all should, should give your own selves a hand of applause in terms of where we are and where we're moving. Clearly, we still have ways to go, but I want to make it very clear that we are not the same institution that we were when we started this process. And it's important that we recognize and understand that. So how far have we actually progressed? First, and this is always amazing, so when I share um, uh, presentations at other universities and I talk to my uh, colleagues at other universities, and I tell them that there are more than 37 central action items in the DEI plan and more than 2,500 different action items across the 50 unit plans, they look at me like I'm crazy. And I think we just need to take a half second to recognize when someone says, well, nothing's really happening at the university with regards to DEI. It's a lot of talk, but nothing's happening. And I know many of you have had relatively sleepless nights for nothing to be happening. So there's a lot of action. And what's happening with that action? Well, it's important, the reason why the plan uh, one of the arguments for the plan in the first place was if we were going to be effective, we needed to be strategic in those efforts. And if you look at the efforts that are going on, even though these action plans were developed from the grassroots level, these were not top-down handed um, um, initiatives, these action items were all developed from the initial planning process through focus groups, through um, uh, social media, uh, opportunities to write forward action items and suggestions for actions, through town hall meetings, and other types of meetings. So these are not the president's action items. These are definitely not my action items. These are action items that you all developed yourselves. But those action items also fit in a way that suggests we're making real progress in terms of the ways that you make long-term cultural change. So if you'll notice on your table, you'll have a, a set of handouts that have a set of infographics that will be part of the slide so you can go in a little further depth than what I'm actually going to be able to. And you're, happy, you're welcome to take them with you. Those of you who are watching on live stream, you can go and download these infographics. So again, that you can uh, um, look at this at your leisure as well as, um, as I go through them. When you think about some of our actions, for instance, raising institutional awareness, what are some of the examples or evidence that we've raised institutional awareness? Well, you can see we've increased the amount of awareness that has occurred with respect to our DEI actions on the website, in terms of our various DEI activities, including the DEI Summit. How many people were at the uh, Summit Community Assembly? And yes, I'm still not Van Jones, just in case you were wondering. Um, also, quite frankly, your presence here Perhaps the most illustrative way of knowing that the university has made progress with regards to DEI awareness is the fact that I keep saying DEI and everybody in this room knows what it means. In fact, when we started this planning process, DEI was, also, was actually the digital in the digital Education Initiative. So James Hilton's not here, 
but now they are AI, academic innovation. So that's just one example of knowing that we've made tremendous progress with regards to simply making DEI a part of the regular lexicon of the university. Another set of efforts to make the change that was important is enhancing individual skills and capabilities. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a number of training and professional development activities that have targeted every level of the university, including the regions. So the Board of Regents have made a commitment to making sure that the university is a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive university. Not only do we report and give an annual report to the Board of Regents on our progress with respect to DEI, but the, the board has actually devoted a major session focusing on DEI and how they can be helpful and supportive with respect to the process in terms of skill building. Another example is the EOs, the executive officers uh, leadership group, have three out of the last four years expend, uh, uh, <coughs> three out of the last four years, engaged in significant DEI skill building exercises in education in their retreat. So when you think about how the university uh, leadership is spending its time, the fact that it is such a um, uh, important and prevalent uh, part of that process, uh, again, makes me feel like we've made some significant progress with respect to DEI. Again, have ways to go, but we've made progress. Another piece to make long-term sustainable change is you have to make sure that your policies, your procedures, and developing new programs are consistent with the values that you're trying to change in the context of DEI. And so this infographic just gives a small example of many of the different um, uh, um, processes that have been put in place since the DEI uh, process began, including the fact that 100% of the schools and colleges have included DEI as part of, or uh, incorporating it as part of the annual review process for faculty. And 42 out of 50 have included it as part of staff. And we've also included a number of initiatives and policies focused specifically on DEI issues, whether it's benefits and other spaces that are new and important. And as one is creating a new culture, you cannot underestimate the importance and power of norm reinforcers. For example, a norm at the university that every single one of us knows is no matter where you are in the world, if I walk up to you and say, go blue, what is the response? Because we constantly reinforce it. Another norm is if you really want a job here at the university, you probably don't want to wear that wonderful uh, scarlet and gray uh, suit that you have in your closet. Just might not go over as well. Green could be a problem too, depending on what happened that year. So we've created and put in place a number of different uh, norms and structures and reinforcers to try to sustain what we're attempting to do. And probably no more important uh, set of reinforcers are DEI leads. We have literally institutional change agents throughout the university whose responsibility is to help coordinate the implementation of the DEI strategic plan for the units. Let me be very clear. To help coordinate the implementation, the leaders of the units are responsible 
for the progress that is made in the context of the DEI strategic plan. So it is not the DEI leads who are responsible, it is the leaders that are responsible. In the same way that for a school and college, while the associate dean for budget may be responsible for overseeing the budget, it is the dean who is responsible for whether or not the school is bankrupt or is not doing what it's supposed to do. And for those deans who are out there listening, sorry about that. But that structure provides, again, a, a cultural norm and reinforcer with regards to um, uh, where we are as an institution. And then last but not least are uh, a number of uh, different programs that are focused on broadening institutional access. For example, one program looking at uh, faculty is the LSNA Collegiate uh, Fellows Program, which is designed to provide 50 new faculty who are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion over the next five years. We already have 24 collegiate fellows that are currently in place. Now, if you think about that, for those of you who are interested in uh, what happens with faculty, having 50 new faculty who will go up through the ranks who are committed, who are uh, selected based on their demonstrated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as those individuals become associate professors, and as those individuals become full professors and hopefully uh, associate chairs, chairs, and maybe even deans someday, that's long-term institutional change. And they're coming in in cohorts, supported, moving forward, making changes in the way in which not only the school and college sees um, uh, DEI, but also making impacts in their schools and colleges, both in terms of their mentors, the students that they mentor, the students that they teach, the scholarship that they do. The university has also made a strong commitment towards affordability and has made a strong commitment in terms of trying to make the University of Michigan more accessible from an affordability standpoint. Despite the sticker price, the University of Michigan is actually the cheapest university for uh, any student with need in the state of Michigan. The Go Blue Guarantee has been a resounding success, letting students who believed that University of Michigan was out of their reach financially understand that in reality it never really was. Another initiative is attempting to make the university more accessible for all. Making sure that individuals across all uh, levels of ability, across different um, uh, levels of uh, ability and disability, be able to contribute to the university. So that we as a university can benefit from those contributions. Because when we have a university that builds barriers for any members of our community, while they are hampered, we as a community are the ones that are the most impoverished by their absence and inability uh, to access and achieve all that they can achieve. Now, these are some of the things that we've done, and these are just a small small number of that 2,500 uh, unit level plus the 37 uh, university level initiatives. But after thinking about all of these different things that have happened, one of the questions that is uh, often asked is, so what is your evidence? This is an empirical uh, university, so what is your evidence that things have actually uh, progressed? First, I would argue many of the interventions are themselves outcomes. Changing policy is an outcome in and of itself. 
creating more opportunities for folks to come at the university and be successful. Many of those uh, initiatives and policies are examples of that. The work that we've done in terms of changing hiring practices is an outcome in and of itself. That will also have benefits down the line, but just having those policy changes are changing the nature of the uh, culture. There's also some very preliminary data that suggests that we're making progress. Uh, one area of uh, uh, progress that we, we see is that in some spaces it looks like we're actually seeing the kinds of changes with respect to attitudes and uh, perceptions and experiences on campus. So as you all know, we started off this process with a um, climate survey of all faculty, or a climate survey of faculty, students, and staff. And that is our baseline for which we will judge in year five uh, part of the progress that we've made to see where we are in those changes. One of the findings that we found was that for many folks at the University of Michigan, the university was a place that they thought was committed to DEI, felt that they could uh, uh, advance and move forward in their careers, and felt like they belonged. Unfortunately, for others, they didn't feel as strongly and as positively towards the university or have as positive a set of experiences as those. Uh, and usually those individuals tended to be underrepresented minorities, tended to be women, tended to be um, uh, uh, members of sexual minority groups, uh, individuals uh, with uh, disabilities. Any group that had traditionally been marginalized or underrepresented tended to have less positive attitudes. Well, we've gotten some small level uh, data uh, to suggest that in certain spaces we're seeing some changes. So one place is in our business and finance um, work. So as part of their annual process of evaluating their climate, they've also included important data from the original climate survey. And what you can see is in the two plus years within BNF, we see significant progress. So significant progress in the extent to which they think their unit is committed to DEI, the extent to which they feel that they're treated with respect, and the extent to which they feel that they have equal opportunity for success. And there are a few other items that have similar kinds of uh, a story in terms of the increase. And when we just look at the DEI commitment items, and we look at it in terms of different groups, so by gender, what we see is much of the greatest improvement are with women, group traditionally marginalized. Similarly, when we look at race and ethnicity, we see increases across the board, but the greatest increases are again amongst the groups that have traditionally experienced as being marginalized. So again, this is very preliminary. It is one unit. I am sure a part of this change is a function of the great work that they're doing in the unit, uh, but I hope that it is also reflective in some ways in terms of where we're moving in um, the larger university. And the last piece of evidence that I would say uh, suggests uh, progress is that in many instances, DEI is now ingrained in some places, uh, in some places, in the way in which we operate as an organization. Another antidote. I was uh, sitting at the um, uh, president's leadership breakfast a couple of weeks ago and the announcement uh, with regards to the Center of Academic Innovation and the discussion of the three different goals of this new center. And the third goal came up, and that goal was to end educational privilege. Now, is that a DEI goal or is that a DEI goal? 
again, an initiative that on the face of it wouldn't necessarily be one that would be directed straight towards DEI, but yet a core function of how they are now operating is a DEI goal. Other examples, Office of University Development just created a new position in terms of an executive director. And that executive director reports directly to the vice president for development. And the executive director will work not only to uh, coordinate the university's efforts around uh, uh, raising support, external support for DEI initiatives, but will also work to provide skills, and better skills, new skills, new development opportunities in the way in which the Office of University of Development works. Expanding who potential uh, donor bases may be. Again, another example of progress in terms of how we are changing as an institution. CRLT has incorporated inclusive teaching not only in their uh, 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 programs and uh, uh, offerings that are focused on inclusive teaching, but in many ways have been doing inclusive teaching practices for a very long time. And so whenever one gets a consultation, whether it's in the context of DEI or not specifically, DEI is embedded in the way in which they do their work. That's change, that's progress, that's when we start talking about cultural change. Now, each of these issues and each of the, this evidence is only a small part of where we are. We still have a ways to go, but it is imperative that we understand that we have made a difference and that we're not the same university that we were at the start of this process. And as many of you are folks who have been working in these areas, it's important that you know that your work has not been in vain. It's important for, that you know that you have moved the needle and the needle is moving. We still have a ways to go, but we're not where we were when we started. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions, uh, comments, thoughts, before we get to the tabletop exercise. Thank you for standing up or sitting there listening to me stand up and talk all this time. We've got microphones. Oh, hello, Rob. We're going to start right over here. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm Antonio Jr. Robbins, uh, Office of Financial Aid. I'm a senior financial aid administrator. Been there for four years. I have a question about so in terms of like staff, the evaluation piece. Mm -hmm. So I have seen like sometimes in the office things like that, people might not follow the DEI plan, like actually get their eight hours of DEI work in. And I know the uh, firm talked about like consequences. So what might those consequences be to like reprimand people who don't take part in the DEI? Well, so at this point, we're not in a, a space to make uh, reprimands at the top levels of the university. At the same point in time, uh, depending on where you are, depending on what those processes are like in terms of how you determine raises, merit, et cetera, um, uh, I think there's an opportunity to include DEI as part of that uh, merit-based um, uh, um, pay, et cetera. Uh, but we do not centrally determine how merit is uh, placed in terms of any institution itself. And we actually, quite frankly, would hope uh, and are, are trying to um, encourage uh, different units to consider how to best implement and utilize the DEI work as part of their annual review process. 
thank you for that. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nando Felton. I'm currently a fourth year student. And my question kind of relates to Mr. Robbins' question, which is, is there any consequences put in place for a student that goes against a DEI plan? Uh, well, so the DEI plan is not um, a student conduct. Um, so there is a student uh, uh, rules of conduct. But the DEI plan was never meant to be a uh, um, rule of conduct with respect to, to students. So there are a number of, uh, of behaviors that have nothing to do with the DEI plan that are outside of the student code of conduct for which there are uh, a set of responsibility or a set of actions that fall in that place. I know you sit with the deans and the associate deans on a regular basis. They get together in their little smoke filled room and talk strategic <laughs> stuff. I'm kind of curious if you've seen over the course of the last four years any change in the culture as it relates to how they talk to each other and talk to you. So that's a good, that's a good point. So another way that I feel like the DEI process uh, that makes me feel good about where we are and where we're moving is I've had the opportunity now for five and a half years uh, to uh, be in this position and to interview uh, all of the finalists for the new deans. What has changed? At the beginning of the process, when I'd asked questions about DEI uh, with the dean candidates, uh, about half of them didn't really know, so I'd have to describe what DEI was. Uh, and then most of the conversation was how much they supported DEI and how positive they felt about DEI at that particular level. What has changed is now in those interviews, almost everyone has read the plans. Everyone is prepared with some ideas of things that they would like to do. They have questions that sound much more informed about what their role should be, what happened in the planning process, and how to move forward. There's variation, uh, just as there's variation in all spaces. Uh, what I would tell you is uh, I feel like uh, this group of deans are uh, strongly committed. Um, they may vary in terms of the level of um, involvement or the nature, I should say, the nature of their involvement with regards to DEI. Uh, but they're all committed, at least visually committed. They are, issues with regards to DEI are part of the budget process in the annual meeting. Uh, so the provosts and the other vice provosts, including myself, ask questions that are focused on DEI. You see changes in the actual budget document where you see DEI in places that you didn't see before. Things like in terms of faculty hiring, spending time talking about explicitly how those processes will be, uh, what, what steps will be taken to make those processes uh, broader. Um, so what I, all I could tell you is I think the level and the frequency of the conversation is higher. Uh, so right now, or this past year, there was a subcommittee on the, uh, the um, dean's uh, group uh, focused specifically on DEI. There were only three subcommittees. One was budget. So I think there's progress. And I would say the same in terms of executive officers. I've uh, had the responsibility or, of uh, meeting all of the executive officer hires that have come in. And I would say, again, the uh, culture has changed. You would not apply to Michigan if you didn't at least do your DEI homework, or at least you wouldn't have gotten to the finalist group. Uh, oh, one more question? One more? Yep, we're going to come right over here. 
Hi, my name is Rebecca Epstein. I'm an executive secretary at the School of Information in my professional life. Um, outside of work, I'm an immigrant rights activist. My question has to do with how DEI is manifesting in its relationship with our strategic vendors and whether there has been discussions about to have a measure of DEI in our strategic vendors as we move forward with our relationships with them. Yes. So actually, I have had conversations uh, with uh, Kevin Haggerty uh, specifically on this issue. Uh, it is something that uh, he is looking at that they're looking at, trying to figure out ways to diversify who the university vendors are, uh, finding ways to also support minority uh, uh, women and other uh, organizations to have greater access to the university, uh, not only in terms of who we deal with, but also figuring out ways to develop new pathways and other support to uh, uh, enhance those uh, programs themselves. And Kevin has talked about some programs that he had uh, uh, been involved with at Texas, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, some of those things will be implemented soon. Yeah. Or, or we have one quick, one very quick. Well, so the, well, well, so actually there are a number of initiatives that are happening within that are uh, focusing uh, outward. One initiative, just as example, is the Wolverine Pathways Program, um, uh, which I think you might have a, uh, the, it is both inward and outward. It's inward in the sense that it is recruiting students here to the University of Michigan, students who are in uh, Detroit, Southfield, and um, uh, Ypsilanti. Um, at the same point in time, though, it is also outward facing in that a major part of that program is also teacher professional development. And the teachers that are hired for the program are from the uh, school districts, the um, Detroit, uh, Ypsilanti, um, uh, Southfield. And so they're providing with, uh, being provided not only with uh, uh, professional development skills to help in terms of teaching the DEI students, but also to take back to the uh, communities they actually teach in. And many of the teachers who've been involved in the program talk about how the Wolverine Pathways program has helped them in terms of their own work uh, back in their uh, local districts and provides a, a space to, to not only learn best practices, but to share in interacting with other uh, faculty. We've got programs with the Center for Educational Outreach, uh, uh, including uh, Wolverine Express, et cetera. Many of the other um, uh, schools and colleges, you mentioned the dental school. Um, the dental school also has a number of uh, outreach programs and I will, uh, where's my good brother, did he leave? Ah, he was just here. Uh, but uh, I'd be happy to, to share those as well. All right, so our next, for the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to engage in a set of tabletop discussions. For those of you who are live streaming and you'd like to, to hang around, please, if you're in a group, uh, uh, please work and um, uh, share these questions. And these are pretty basic questions and after uh, 15 minutes or so, we will come back and uh, share out. And these uh, three questions are, how has your unit changed with respect to DEI since we started the planning process? Second, in what areas do you feel there's a need for greater progress? And third, in what areas have you seen the greatest progress? 
So please, you've got discussion leaders at each table. They will help lead the discussion. Um, and hopefully we'll get through all three of these questions. Uh, excuse me. I know you really want to continue talking, and I promise you at the end of this, there'll be a few minutes for you to continue the conversation, and we'd like to encourage that. But we, we also need to uh, uh, move forward. Uh, before I uh, go out and um, uh, ask for uh, some of you to share your thoughts and um, uh, ideas, I want to also make sure that we announce uh, one of the uh, 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 new DEI uh, initiatives has been the James S. Jackson Distinguished Career Award for Diversity Scholarship. Our uh, second recipient, uh, who I can think of no better person, uh, happens to be here, uh, and I'm sure I'm embarrassing her, but I want to announce the, the, the fact that uh, Pat Gurin uh, is our second career res recipient. She will have a public lecture called Collectivity, Community, and Connections in the Pursuit of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It'll be Monday, November 18th at 4 p.m. in East Hall in room 3024. This award was designed to be the major award for a lifetime of contribution and achievement in advancing what we consider to be diversity, equity, and inclusion scholarship. And there literally could be no better person than Pat Gurin. Uh, and so I uh, invite you all to come, and I just want to <laughs> acknowledge Pat as well. All right, we've got about five quick minutes uh, before uh, wrapping up uh, to hear some of your uh, thoughts and experiences. So who would like to share? Ah. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Uh, Marissa Taylor, Center for Educational Outreach. Thank you for the shout out for Wolverine Express as well. Uh, <laughs> A uh, big highlight that came from this table, especially from today, is the idea of as we're educating the population and our community, we know there's a lot of great resources for faculty, there's a lot of great resources for students, there's also a lot of great resources for staff. Um, one of the things that came up today is, hey, I know there's a lot of student resources for, from the Spectrum Center, but what do they do for staff? They provide free trainings <laughs> to your entire group. and so. There's a lot of different units on campus that provide staff-wide resources, especially for free. So if there was a way for um, DEI to kind of display that even more, and they might be doing it now, but if there's a better way to do it, that's a really great takeaway from our table. Hi everyone, um, I just wanna kind of share some themes from our table and also maybe a celebration. Um, so the first thing that we talked about was inclusive language and giving accessibility options when um, planning meetings, planning events on campus. We thought that that was really good because somebody said 10 years ago that wasn't a thing. Um, some things that we think need to be improved, possibly um, doing more to provide support to departments in developing um, resources for dis disability and accessibility issues. Um, and also making sure that those spaces are accessible to those students so that we know what they need. Um, another one was increasing communication between and inside units about programs, initiatives, those types of things so that you know something in Michigan Medicine could possibly have you know, some connection to something that's happening in LSNA. So greater integration across campus. Um, and lastly, just another opportunity for professorships and maybe something among staff to celebrate those who are committed to DEI um, and just bringing more attention to that. So thank you. Okay. 
Hello. Oh, hi. hi. Um, I'm Bridget. I'm an LSA junior. Um, and something that I um, felt really strongly about was um, having there be more me clear messaging for students about how important and central DEI is to the University of Michigan, especially in those initial interactions with the university, um, whether that be on tours or during orientation. Um, and you know, outlining the DEI strategic plan, maybe not as in depth as we went today, <laughs> um, but but uh, definitely like being clear about you know what exactly the plan is and why it's so important. Um, and also, I felt really strongly about um, having the DEI plan and maybe just more faculty and staff um, recognize students and the student groups that are doing really, really great work in regards to DEI initiatives, um, whether that be through um, you know, being a diversity peer educator or through student groups, because there's so many amazing things that students are doing. And I know faculty and staff are doing really great things too, um, but to just connect students more to the plan would be really, really great. Hello, uh, I'm Frank from Math High Botanical Gardens, and in our group we did talk about um, the importance of the DEI committees and in including leadership into the DEI committees. And one area that those committees do lead to is discussing DEI within our units. And an area that we acknowledge that there's a need of improvement is actually staff training regarding LGBTQ plus issues uh, and what is being gender inclusive and also how to create uh, time and space to be vulnerable um, and yet supportive of our DEI journey, especially for those folks that have a marginalized identity, how we can all come together then and react and debrief when there's any issues related to DEI across our society and our institution. Thank you. Okay. So, I, th I would love to go around further, but I think I've got the signal we're about at time. I just want to throw out a couple of um, closing remarks with regards to sort of what's next on the horizon as it relates to DEI. So over the next year to two years plus, these are the kinds of things that I, I uh, think that we'll be working on, especially along with uh, a myriad of other uh, issues. As first is to integrate sexual misconduct prevention into our DEI efforts. As many of you know, uh, the university has also made a, uh, a strong commitment to create uh, an environment that is uh, free of uh, sexual harassment and sexual misconduct, uh, which in some ways is a little funny to me because there's no way in the world that we could achieve our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and still be a space where sexual harassment and gender harassment is still tolerated and uh, rampant. So incorporating um, uh, the great work that's happening in sexual misconduct uh, prevention into our larger DEI infrastructure and space uh, will be an important part of uh, how we're moving forward. A second area that I think is one that uh, will need, be a need of even greater uh, attention is trying to provide our uh, managers mm -hmm. Uh, with more skills and tools to address uh, issues related to DEI. So we've got uh, skill development uh, throughout, but oftentimes the tensions that are a necessary part of our advances, our advancement, plays out in a way that it ends up being on the plate of our managers. And many of our managers have um, uh, rightfully pointed out that they weren't trained for this. And so it's important that we begin to think about ways to better empower 
those, uh, the managers to be able to think about some of the kinds of questions that were asked today in terms of how do we better implement uh, uh, DEI in the context of our annual review process into a meaningful um, uh, uh, compensation or incentive uh, plan. Uh, how do we deal with uh, individuals who are at different uh, levels of skills within our unit uh, around DEI and to create the kind of um, equitable and inclusive environment that we're targeting. So a more focused effort uh, with regards to our managers, our department chairs, uh, et cetera, is an area that is in uh, uh, need and will be in focus. Also to provide greater uh, DI uh, skill development for us as individuals to interact effectively across difference. So most of the uh, initiatives that I had uh, talked about are really focused on structural changes and policy changes and creation of new programs and things that are at the level of the organization. But the reality is most of our experience is relational, is a function of how we interact with each other as people and as humans. Uh, and to assume that everybody has the ability to interact effectively across differences is a fallacy and is one that would doom our, process, our progress. So I think as we move forward, thinking and creating greater opportunities for all of us to be more effective in integrating across our differences. Acknowledging and valuing diversity does not necessarily lead to the benefits of diversity. And the benefits are in our ability to interact effectively, respectfully, productively with each other, both in the context of those differences, but also in the context of our commonalities and our common uh, efforts, work efforts. So more focus there in the future. And then last but not least, continuing planning for year five in terms of our evaluation. And again, people, uh, in order for us to uh, justify in some spaces the work that we're doing, it's important for us to have an effective evaluation with regards to showing the progress that has been made. And even more importantly, it's important for us to be able to identify what has been most effective so that we can double down, scale up, create off of those uh, effective programs, and in some instances, those programs that were great ideas but weren't uh, effective. Okay, let's redeploy those resources to something else new or to something that we do know well. So the valuation planning process is something uh, that we'll be spending a great deal of time over the next two years. And I should say we've already begun that process, but this will be ramping up um, even further. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. And I just want to end on one last note. So if you don't understand what the theme of today was, We are a better university than we were three years ago. Thank you very much. And I look forward to continuing with you in our uh, pursuit of our larger goal and objective. Thank you.